Good morning. Good morning. We're so glad that all of you have come this morning. By the way, the uh, pianist did not lose her place. She stopped playing so that we could hear ourselves blend together. And it was beautiful. I appreciate the spirit in which you have brought yourself this morning and in which you anticipate that spirit striving with us through this service. Connor will be baptized today. And I want each of you to reflect back on your own experience of baptism. I'm sure all of us remember the day we were baptized. That covenant sticks with us forever. And as you share with Connor today, may it be a personal experience for you. For some of you, it's been a long time ago. For others, just a short time. But take this opportunity to commune with God and reflect on that covenant that you have made with him. Sweet is the feeling I have repented, reaching the past and righted my own. Here is to Worship's taken from Genesis, the sixth chapter, verses 62 and 63. Even so, ye must be born again into the kingdom of heaven, of water and of the Spirit, and be cleansed by the blood, even the blood of mine only begotten, that ye may be sanctified from all sin and enjoy the words of eternal life in this world and eternal life in the world to come, even immortal glory. For by the water ye keep the commandments, by the Spirit ye are justified, and by the blood ye are sanctified. Just 
just like you promised you came there to stay I just had to pray and Jesus said come to the water stand by my side I know you are thirsty you won't be denied I felt every teardrop when in darkness you cried and I strove to remind you that for those tears I died your goodness so great I can't understand but dear Lord I know now that all this was planned I know you're here now and always will be your love boosts my chains and in you I'm free but Jesus why me Jesus said come to the water stand by my side I know you are thirsty you won't be denied I felt every tear drop when in darkness you cried and I strove to remind you that for those tears I died Jesus, I give you my heart and my soul. I know that without God I'd never be whole. Savior, you opened all the right doors. And I thank you and praise you from earth's humble shores. Take me, I'm yours. Jesus said, come to the water, stand by my side. I know you are thirsty, you won't be denied. I felt every tear drop when in darkness you cried. And I strove to remind you. For those tears I died I felt every tear drop When in darkness you cried And I strove to remind you That for those tears I died Connor, you and I go back a long way together. Uh, I was there when you were born in the ambulance in front of your grandma's house, because we lived next door to you, which was a pretty cool experience. The only objection I had to your timing was if you had done it a day earlier, it would have been on my birthday. <laughs> but I have watched you grow up I have been impressed by how you have developed. It has been a blessing to know you. And it's an honor to me that you asked me to speak today, to have this part in this service. Yesterday, Connor, I went to see my grandson Britton play his last game of basketball this you're in, you know Britain, he's the same age you are. Um, he's been on a basketball team a couple of years now. And I was just amazed as I watched him and his team play yesterday about uh, to see how much they have come along. And I could see them, I could see the results of their coaching. But more than that, I could, I could see the response that they made 
to their coach's directions. You know, when you coach, I've coached and coached wrestling for a little while, and uh, I've been around coaches, and one of the things that you quickly find out is that some people are coachable and some aren't. Uh, and you can always tell whether somebody is coachable or not by watching the little things, okay? Sometimes you have people who have all kinds of natural athletic ability, but because they have a lot of natural athletic ability, they think they know everything. And so they don't listen to their coaches. And when the coach says, when they're playing defense and basketball, get your hands up, and those kids come out there and their hands don't come up, you can see by the little things what is happening in their heart. You can see that they really think that they are smarter than their coach. They really think that they don't have to listen because they've got it all. And you see them on offense and the coach says pass the ball and the kid never passes the ball. Okay? And you can see just watching those little things what is going on in their hearts. So little things are really important. Let's see, I guess it would be yeah, 49 years ago I found the Lord and I was baptized. And Shortly after I was baptized, I got orders to go to the country of Vietnam. On my way there, I stopped at home and spent a week or two at home. And uh, I have, you know, you, you have a sister, and you probably pick on her some. Okay, I would be surprised if you didn't. Well, I have six younger sisters. Okay, so I picked on them a lot. Okay, but when the Lord brought me to himself, he changed some things in me. And one of the things that he did was he put a very tender spirit within me. Where it hurt me to see other people suffer. And I didn't change that in me, he changed that in me. And I can remember when I went home, and I was there for about a week, and I was talking to my second to youngest sister. And they knew I had been baptized, and uh, we, I came from a good Catholic family. But shortly before I left, I was talking to my little sister. And she made the statement, she said, Ken, I don't know what happened to you, but you're not mean anymore. Now, did I ever do things to her that were really awfully cruel and mean? Probably not. But I did many things that were a little bit cruel and mean. I picked on her. And she could tell by the little things what was happening in my heart. And what was happening in my heart was that I wanted to be noticed and it didn't matter who got hurt in the process. Okay? And so she could tell by looking at the little things I did what was going on inside. And in that week that I was home, you know, did she see any big things that happened that told her that the Lord had changed my heart? No. But what she saw was the little things. And the little things told her that something had changed in here. And I was no longer the person that I once was. I used to be every once in a while called out to do marriage counseling. And one of the hardest things to deal with the marriage counseling is that when couples are having trouble, it is very seldom 
a big thing that has happened. When you see difficulties in a marriage, invariably, it's because of little things that have been either done or not done in that marriage. And that makes it very, very difficult to deal with because each little thing by itself doesn't seem very important. And the husband or wife, whoever is the transgressor, uh, can hide behind it and say, what do you mean I never tell you I love you? I told you I loved you back last April. Okay? But what the husband or wife, the, what the other party is saying, wait a minute. It's the little things that tell me what is in your heart. It's the fact that we go days and days and days and you never speak to me tenderly and you never tell me how much I mean to you. It's the little things where you choose other activities ahead of me. That tells me what's going on in your heart. The little things are really, really important in a marriage. Because the little things are a reflection of what our hearts are like. Remember that John Denver song? It's the little things that make a house a home. Now there are two things in the scriptures, two examples in the scriptures that I want to talk to you, Connor, about concerning little things. One of them is the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And you know what happened there. You've heard this over and over and again. You know that Adam and Eve were tempted by Satan. And they were tempted by such a little thing. Okay? They were tempted. The, the serpent said to them, eat of the fruit. Go ahead. It's okay. It's just a little thing. Okay? And it's, it's hardly worth, it seems to people when they look at that, it's hardly worth noticing. I've read things, you know, Chris, Christopher Hitchens and some other atheists. A lot of times will criticize an, an episode like that because they say, What? He condemned the whole human race to hell because they ate of the fruit? It's, that's such a little thing. How can that, you know, it's hardly worthy, worthy of notice, much less condemnation. But you know, what was important about that is what that little thing revealed about Adam's and Eve's hearts. Because what they were doing when they partook of that fruit, what was going on in their heart, was this. It doesn't matter what God says. All that matters is what I want. The little thing revealed what was going on in their heart, and the scripture says that God looks upon the heart. That's what happened in the garden. There's another example of a little thing. That was when Jesus was in Galilee. And he decided that he was going to go to Jordan to see John. Now, that was a decision. The scripture makes that clear. He wasn't just out ministering and Somebody said, hey, John's over here baptizing. And he said, oh, as long as he's there, I'll say hi to my cousin. That's not the way it happened at all. The scripture says, then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Jesus made a decision. I'm going to go from Galilee to Jordan. And I'm going to, look, I'm going to track down John and I'm going to be baptized. He decided that. And it says that when he got there, John said, John forbade him. John said, you know, John said, no way. I'm not going to baptize you. You know, John knew who Jesus was. He's the one who was preaching. There's a guy coming after me 
whose shoelaces I'm not worthy to tie. So John knew who Jesus was, and that's why he was reticent about that. He said, wait a minute, me baptize Jesus? No, how about him baptizing me? And Jesus responded to John, and he said this, Suffer it to be so now. You know, it kind of, if you literally translate that, you remember the old Star Trek, or, uh, yeah, the Star Trek episode with Jean-Luc Picard? Okay, he was the, the captain of the Starship Enterprise. You know, everybody looks at my bald head and says, you know, calls me Mr. Clean or James Carville. Okay, I say, no, 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 I'm Jean-Luc. That's who I am, okay? That's who you think of when you see this head, Jean-Luc Picard. Okay, but, you know, somebody had come to him and they'd say, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this. And Jean-Luc had this famous statement. And he would say, make it so. Remember that? Make it so. And that reflected his authority. He could say, make it so, and it got done. And that's what literally what that means when, when John was saying, no, I need to be baptized of you, of you, not you of me. And Jesus said, make it so. For He said, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Again, translate that literally means this is what is proper for righteousness to be fully expressed. Now you look at that it seems like such a small thing. Here Jesus is saying, wait a minute, this is the pinnacle of righteousness. This is how it will be fully expressed for me to be baptized. He didn't say, he, what, he didn't say, I can go out and heal a thousand people. He didn't say, I do this. He didn't say, I do that. He said, this is how righteousness is to be true, fully expressed. And he said that because he was listening to the Father and the father said to him, here is what I want you to do. So by that small act, he went to John. John's already in the river. Jesus came down into the river. John baptized him. By that small act was reflected Jesus' heart. By the small thing. And the scripture says, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. If we respond as Adam responded, by the little things, if we respond like he responded, we're separated from God. If we respond as Jesus did, we experience life. And we experience it gloriously and abundantly. So Connor, you're here today to be baptized. Now why did God choose that act? Why didn't he choose some wonderful thing, some very hard thing to do. Why didn't he say, Connor, if you're going to be my son, you're going to be the first eight-year-old to climb Mount Everest. You're going to be the first eight-year-old to swim across the Missouri River. Okay? If he had said that, your parents would have invested a lot of money in mountain climbing training and swimming lessons and all that kind of thing. But that's not what he did. If the saving of our souls depended on our work, it would make sense for him to choose some huge, hard thing for us to do, and that would save us. But God isn't saying that the saving of our souls depends on the things that we accomplish. It depends on letting God take control of our hearts and our lives. Baptism might seem like a little thing, but if it's done for the right reasons, it's not a little thing. What is the right reason? It's our heart. Listen to what Jesus said. You know, his disciples came to him and said, at one time in his ministry and said, Master, you need to eat. Apparently Jesus got 
so carried away with his ministry, he forgot to eat. Okay? And his disciples notice that and they say, Master, you need to eat. And Jesus said, I have food to eat that you don't know anything about. And the disciples looked at one and said, another, they've been with him. They said, what? Has anybody brought him food to eat? And here's how Jesus responded. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. This is what satisfies the hunger that's inside of me. To do the will of the Father. That's a reflection of Jesus' heart. Or from John 8, 28, Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. Baptism is supposed to be a reflection of where our heart is. Adam and Eve's rebellion was a reflection of where their hearts were. Jesus surrendered to God in baptism. That was a reflection of where his heart was. So Connor, the question I've got for you today is, where is your heart today? You know, you can go down into that water and be baptized. It might not mean a thing if your heart isn't right with God. Is your heart where Adam's heart was? Where you want to do your own thing and do it your way? Or is it where Jesus' heart was when he came to John in the River Jordan? You know, the scripture says that baptism is symbolic of the grave. Now, we think of the grave as being a bad thing because that's where we go when we die. But Jesus pointed something out that just as important as the fact that we're going to die is the fact that we're going to be resurrected again. And he said this, when you go under the water, you want the things that Adam wanted to be buried under the water, to die, to stay there in the grave. And what you're saying is, when I come up out of the water, I want what Jesus wanted, to come up out of the water with me. I want there to be a hunger to do what God wants me to do. Now, I don't know, Connor, if that hunger is in your heart or not. I can't know your heart. But God does. And if you care about what he cares about, if you want to be his and your heart to be his, then there are some wonderful promises connected with that. And the most important of those wonderful promises is what happened to Jesus when he surrendered and was baptized by John. It says, Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So God's response to Jesus having the right heart was to send his Holy Spirit to be with him. And Connor, you have the same claim to that promise as Jesus did. You have claimed to the Holy Spirit. And when those hands are laid on you, after your baptism, you can expect 
that the Holy Spirit is going to be given to you. Now you've heard me say in sermons before, talk about the Holy Spirit. The scriptures call the Holy Spirit the paraclete. Not the parakeet, but the paraclete. And the paraclete, which is the Holy Spirit, literally means the one who walks beside us. Now the scriptures go even further than that. They say not only does the Holy Spirit walk beside us as the paraclete, but he lives inside us as the abiding comforter. He lives in us. He takes in residence in us. What a privilege to have the Holy Spirit, God himself, say, you know what? Because your heart is right, I'm going to choose to take up residence in you. Now, Connor, when that Holy Spirit is given you, you might not see the Holy Spirit come down in the form of a dove as it did with Jesus. Or you might. I don't know. Okay? You might not hear a mighty rushing wind like they did on the day of Pentecost, although you might, I don't know. You might not speak in tongues, although you might. Okay, you might not see the glory of God like a cloud, as it as did the people at Azusa Street, although you might. I don't know how God will reveal Himself to you. What He does there is up to Him. But Connor, be assured of one thing. No matter what happens there, when God promises you his Holy Spirit, he fulfills that promise. If your heart is surrendered to God in your baptism, you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the gift of the Holy Spirit. He will take up residence inside you. Jesus says, I am with you always. You know, I remember Mary Jo sharing testimony about my son Daniel. When Daniel took his CPA test, okay, and Mary Jo was praying for him on a Friday. He took the test on a Saturday, okay, and her testimony was she was praying and she said, Lord, be with Daniel. And she said the Holy Spirit spoke to her in rebuke and said, I am always with him. Pray that he realizes my presence. The Holy Spirit is with you always if you will accept his companionship. The job of the Holy Spirit is to reveal the thoughts and intents of the heart. To point out to us what the significance is of the little things that we do and choose. The significance of the choices that we make. And I hope, Connor, that your witness today is this. Just as Jesus experienced, I am hearing from the Father what he want, that he wants me to be baptized, and I hunger to do his will. I hope the rest of you, when you see Connor go down into that baptismal water, that there will be a collective desire here that says, Lord, renew this in me again. You know, I'm reminded of the statement of Alma. When he said, and now behold, I say unto you, my brethren, if you have experienced a change of heart, and if you have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, I would ask, can you feel so now? You know, the rest of us took the step that Connor took many of us a long time ago. And we have seen ourselves wander away from God and come back and wander and come back. And what I'm praying is that we, as we watch Connor be baptized, 
will say with the psalmist, I delight to do thy will, O God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Connor's the one being baptized this morning, but uh, you all play a part. The Doctrine and Covenant says he needs to say a few things in front of the congregation, and we're going to do that now. Connor, are you ready to repent of all your sins? Yes. And are you willing to take upon you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and be faithful until the end? Yes. Connor Matthias Staten, having authority given me of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Honor will now be confirmed by uh, elders Scott Easton and Scott Staten. This is the first Scottish confirmation I have ever witnessed. <laughs> uh, thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and this opportunity we have to come here to this service, which we recognize you as our God our Father, and our strength. We also want to give you thanks for this day, for what you brought before us, this ordinance, which was laying on the hands, which our brother Connor has chosen this day. He might come and be a part of your church and of your kingdom. Father, we're thankful for the sacrifice of your son Jesus, which he gave us away back into you. And through his ministry here on this earth, he set ordinances into the church, which we are to obey. And this day, young Connor has decided to follow you through taking upon him the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and has entered into the waters of baptism, and now has asked that we would lay his hand, our hands upon him, that he receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, that it might guide and protect and direct him all the days of his life. I know as I've seen young Connor here at church, I see him run around having such a desire and a love for knowledge, and his eyes light up when he sees and learns of new things. But this day, may your spirit come upon him in such a way that he will have the love and joy of your son Jesus, that he might all the days of his life walk with the guidance of that spirit which would give him truth and light. For there's no greater gift than eternal life to be with you Fathers, he is no longer a boy, but now he's a young man and given responsibilities he had not just an hour ago, for he is now the body of this congregation and that of your church, and may his name be written in the book of life, that he might always walk in the steadfastness and the faith of your son Jesus Christ, and that he might bear that image in his countenance. May his family guide and direct him in times as he grows, and may you always give him that wisdom to be humble, and each and every day that he wakes up, may he rejoice in the day that you have given him, and that he would ask, Father, what do you have for me to do? And may he get on his knees in his prayer time and ask for help, and any time that he has fallen short, may he come to you in repentance and asking forgiveness, and also asking those he might have offended, but that he would always be mindful of the needs of those around about him. 
Father, we love you for giving us this day. And we love Connor and each and every soul in this building because you have commanded us to be full of love. And we desire this day to move forth and that we might always be seeking to bring forth and establish the cause of Zion is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.